My name is Mikola Gnatovsky. I'm a professor of international law, international human rights law, and uh, international humanitarian law, and also international criminal law from Kyiv, from Tarashchenko University. And uh, I've uh, specialized on the issues of uh, detention, deprivation of liberty, uh, and uh, fight against torture since many years. And uh, in uh, uh, 2009, uh, I was elected as a member of the European Committee for the Prevention of Torture uh, in respect of Ukraine. And uh, since 2015, I'm the president of that committee. As a president of the CPT, I um, coordinate the work of the CPT. Um, I chair the meetings of the CPT and the meetings of its bureau, which is the governing body of the CPT uh, between the, the sessions. Uh, and also I do a lot of uh, uh, meetings and talks with uh, the authorities of various countries, both within the context of CPT visits and also outside of this context as a separate high-level talks to advance our uh, dialogue with those authorities. So the CPT uh, stands for the European Committee for the Prevention of Torture and Inhuman or Degrading Treatment or Punishment. It is an international body which is independent and is uh, created uh, in accordance with the 1987 European Convention on the Prevention of Torture and Inhuman or Degrading Treatment uh, or Punishment, which entered into force in 1989. And uh, the CPT is now more than 30 years old. Uh, it uh, uh, has visited uh, all the member states of the Council of Europe because all the member states of the Council of Europe are parties to the CPT Convention. In fact, it is impossible to become a member of the Council of Europe now without ratifying the, uh, the Convention. Uh, and the CPT uh, is created uh, to um, uh, supplement the um, uh, European Court of Human Rights uh, uh, in uh, um, trying to uh, implement the provisions of the European Convention on Human Rights, in particular when it comes to Article 3 of the Convention, the Prohibition of Torture and Inhuman or Degrading Treatment or Punishment, uh, in all member uh, states of the Council of Europe, in all states parties uh, to this uh, Convention. The CPT does so uh, by um, uh, carrying out uh, a system of visits to uh, all uh, these uh, states. And uh, uh, during these visits, the CPT has uh, unlimited, uh, unrestricted access to all places of deprivation of liberty, to all persons who are deprived of their liberty, to all relevant documents, to uh, all relevant premises, uh, to all staff members and government officials. And the CPT uh, has established um, ongoing dialogue with uh, all the um, uh, states' parties to its convention, which are the states, uh, members of the Council of Europe, uh, to improve the treatment of persons deprived of their liberty and to prevent and address uh, the existing risks uh, of uh, uh, ill treatment, including uh, torture. And this uh, uh, covers, uh, of course, prisons, and the CPT is traditionally seen as a body which deals with, uh, with penitentiary institutions, but it also covers uh, police, it covers um, psychiatric hospitals, uh, social care homes, establishments for foreigners detained under aliens legislation, and uh, other similar uh, places. And the CPT acts proactively, trying to prevent the problem rather to, than to address the existing problems. Of course, when there is an existing problem, the CPT also makes recommendations to uh, address those. It uh, works with the governments by formulating recommendations, by asking for additional information, by asking for comments from the government. And then, in a dialogue with the government, looking for the best ways and identifying the best ways to improve uh, the situation on the spot. So, in this respect, the CPT has empirically, by visiting countries, by seeing various situations, by uh, analyzing the international legal framework and also the domestic legislation, to um, formulate certain common approaches to all states. We understand that there are differences between countries. We understand that uh, certain countries uh, have different traditions, they have different legacies, but uh, certainly we can formulate some 
general standards because we think that they emanate from the European Convention on Human Rights, from uh, the uh, jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights. And uh, we uh, try to publish those standards and to make them available to the general public, to all the states, to lawyers, to the courts. And these standards can be helpful uh, for the governments which wish to improve the situation. They could be helpful to the European Court of Human Rights and to domestic courts. And actually all of them make use of the uh, standards. I need to say though that the CPT was not created as a standard setting body. It's a monitoring body. In fact, in the uh, Council of Europe, there is the so-called strategic triangle, which includes uh, standard setting. And this is normally the intergovernmental process. And it is linked to the activities of the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe. Then there is monitoring, and monitoring is done by independent bodies. And the CPT is a classical independent body, which has a very strong, uh, very, very strong mandate according to the 1987 convention. And there is the second, uh, the, the, third, the third part of this triangle is the uh, cooperation activities, because the Council of Europe also helps states to implement uh, the standards, uh, the recommendations from monitoring bodies. But uh, the, uh, the, the interesting thing is that the CPT, because it has such, such a rich experience, it was in a position to formulate uh, certain standards, not in abstracto, but very much linked to the, to the real situation. And that has been found helpful by the European Court of Human Rights and by the governments. The CPT standards are never set in stone, they uh, evolve. Uh, they evolve uh, uh, due to a number of factors. One uh, of them is that the CPT itself uh, gains more experience and looks into various uh, options how to handle the same problems. So they can expand in a way, uh, there could, could be alternatives and the CPT could just uh, add things which do not make the standard necessarily higher, but make it more realistic and more uh, sort of implementable, if I may put it this way. Um, the CPT standards also uh, may take into account the uh, level of uh, the development of the countries and the CPT sometimes resorts to identifying the minimum standard and the desirable standard. For example, um, the CPT standard on uh, living space uh, for prisoners, uh, they, they have evolved and uh, um, in 2015 we published uh, a document which summarized those standards. And even though we maintained, of course, our position that the minimum standard should be, for example, four square meters in a multi-occupancy cell per person, but um, we also said that in principle, uh, the desirable standard would be when, as, when a country is constructing new facilities, that it should be uh, six square meters for the first person and then plus four for the next, uh, for next person. So, for example, it makes uh, the uh, minimum cell for two persons already not eight meters, but 10 meters. So, uh, and, and, and we thought that this would be realistic also based on our discussions with the government. But this is the desirable standard and we opposed it to the minimum standard. Our standards also in evolve with the development of um, um, science, with the development of, uh, uh, for example, uh, healthcare uh, in various countries. Uh, our standards for psychiatry, for example, have uh, uh, evolved. Uh, one example would be here the use of means of restraint. In, in, in a psychiatric setting and uh, there we took into account the developments in uh, various European countries, uh, some of which decided not to use, for example, mechanical restraint at all. Uh, some of them uh, have their reservations on the use of seclusion and we tried to incorporate this and we tried to also um, to make our standards compatible with the developments in international law, namely uh, the uh, con uh, Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. So there are various ways how our standards can, uh, can evolve. Again, we are always extremely attentive to the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights and uh, we uh, never contradict the court, but uh, uh, we uh, can suggest certain, um, certain things that bring matters a bit forward, that uh, make uh, space for progress, so to say. The CPT has been created 
as a body that would make the work of the court, of the European Court of Human Rights, in a way uh, easier and more progressive because uh, it added the fact-finding element. The court has, of course, uh, in theory, the possibility to carry out its own fact-finding missions, but uh, the court resorts to these measures uh, very rarely. And also it is clear that um, such a sensitive topic as uh, the situation of persons deprived of their liberty, it requires more systemic work on the ground. And that's why uh, the CPT, on the one hand, also creates uh, the basis for the court uh, through the fact-finding job. So, in a way, the CPT is meant to be a fact-finding body. However, uh, one res important reservation is, is necessary uh, here because uh, the dialogue between the state and the CPT and the findings, the actual findings of the CPT on the spot must remain confidential according to the European Convention uh, on the Prevention of Torture because uh, uh, this is the price we are paying for the full, unlimited and unrestricted access to all the places of deprivation of liberty. However, uh, the vast majority of European states decided to uh, publish all CPT reports. Uh, in fact, over 90% of all CPT reports uh, uh, have been published. And uh, more and more countries have already opted for the so-called automatic publication procedure, 12 at the moment. So uh, this, this makes our findings more accessible. And once they are published, so we never do it without the consent of the government. But once the government gives their authorization to publish the report, then the fact-finding part becomes, becomes available for the court. And the court uses it. And you know that when, when, for example, there are certain applications coming from this or that prison, the court would uh, always check whether the prison in question has been in the relevant period of time visited by the CPT, and if it had been visited, then the court would, of course, use, uh, use the CPT's findings in its, in its judgment. So this is one part. The other part is the standards of the CPT. Uh, the CPT is not a standard-setting body per se, but it has developed certain standards, and the court is uh, making uh, use of uh, the CPT's standards. The court uh, quotes the CPT's standards whenever there is uh, an applicable standard. Uh, and this happens not even only in uh, cases which deal with uh, Article 3 of the European Convention of Human Rights, which is exactly the article uh, behind the, 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 the CPT's mandate, but also sometimes uh, about other um, relevant articles, Article 5, 6, 8. I've, I've even seen a case where the court quoted CPT standards in relation to Article 9 of the Convention. So, in fact, uh, this is also uh, uh, helpful for the court and uh, this has started um, since uh, the, the, the new European Court of Human Rights uh, following the uh, entering into force of, of Protocol 11 to, to the European Convention on Human Rights uh, started to operate. Uh, and increasingly, uh, more and more, the, the court is, 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 is using the CPT's, uh, the CPT's standards. Um, I can give you two examples which I think are very illustrative of, the, uh, of, this, of this process. One relates to the um, uh, situations of uh, persons who, um, who, who were punished, uh, who received the punishment of uh, a life sentence, the so-called real life sentence, meaning a life without parole. Uh, and the CPT uh, formulated a position that um, uh, penologically uh, imposing such uh, sanctions, imposing such punishments uh, is not right because then it is impossible for the person to progress during the term uh, of, of punishment and it, 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 it runs counter to the very idea of the deprivation of liberty as a criminal sanction. Um, and of course also it, it uh, makes the person concerned lose the hope and lose the, a, a, any sort of any incentive to, uh, to progress and to develop and to uh, become a better person, so to say. Uh, so the CPT said that in its uh, uh, view, uh, such, um, such a punishment uh, might be uh, incompatible uh, with uh, the requirements of Article 3 of the European Convention on Human Rights. And the CPT said it very clearly, um, uh, for example, uh, in 2012, during the adoption of uh, two reports, 
um, about its visits. Uh, one was on Switzerland and the other one was on Bulgaria. And uh, the CPT was very happy to see that uh, its uh, reasoning was accepted by the European Court of Human Rights uh, in a very well-known uh, Grand Chamber judgment in Winter and others uh, versus the United Kingdom. And this, the, we were happy to see that this, this was the basis for the court's uh, opinion that indeed there should be this right to hope, there should, be, there should be a review after a certain period of time, not necessarily resulting in, uh, in, change, in the change of the sentence, not necessarily resulting in, in the parole or any other uh, way of releasing the person, but nevertheless, uh, this, uh, uh, this still needs, needs to happen and this would make the job of the penitentiary institution more meaningful and, 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 and uh, it will uh, actually make it in a way easier. Another example is an extremely well-known uh, Grand Chamber judgment um, of the European Court of Human Rights in uh, Mursic versus Croatia case. Uh, primarily when it comes to the issue of uh, living space per prisoner and there uh, uh, the, the court took uh, uh, of course advantage of the CPT's standards uh, on the minimum requirement of, of living space per person uh, in uh, penitentiary institutions. Uh, however, uh, the court did not uh, say that uh, any living space going below the minimum standard defined by the CPT as four square meters per person in a multi-occupancy cell would necessarily automatically mean that Article 3 has been violated. But the CPT actually has never said this because um, we thought, and, and uh, which is why I think the, for the CPT uh, the, the motion judgment is perfectly acceptable and, and uh, is perfectly reasonable, we never said that it would automatically mean the violation. It's actually only for the court to say. But it will create a very great risk that the violation will be there. So whenever, whenever the actual uh, living space goes be below four square meters, then we can say that there is a tangible risk of, of violation of Article 3. So uh, there should be certain factors to mitigate the situation, because the CPT also, when publishing its uh, standards on minimum legal space in 2015, on minimum living space per person in 2015, um, the CPT uh, said that uh, uh, there are other factors that need to be taken into account, like the, the, uh, like the, the, the lighting, the heating, the hygiene, uh, the outdoor exercise, uh, and so on, the, the, the time the person can spend out of the cell during a day, and so on. So there's, there's plenty of factors here and the court said that yes also if you have the, 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 the actual legal space below the minimum standard then there must, might, must be other ways to sort of to, to mitigate this of course if the person only sleeps in a cell only sleeps in the cell where which is less than four square meters but otherwise for the most part of the day the person is outside and is engaged in meaningful activities and everything is clean and, and, and so on and so forth then no one would actually reasonably uh, say that uh, them, there is a violation of Article 3. And then the court said, went further and said that when it goes even below uh, three square meters, so it, it's just for the situation between four and three, and if it's below three square meters, then this presumption that, that there, is, there, is a, there is a violation is in fact almost impossible to deny. So in this respect, I think it was also helpful and it was also obvious that the court uh, was fully aware of the CPT's approach and it, uh, new, it, it, it produced a very nuanced uh, decision. In fact, I wanted to say that uh, um, there is a constant dialogue between the court and the CPT, not just uh, on the level of publishing documents on the part of the CPT and issuing judgments on the part of the court, but there is also a dialogue uh, between uh, the institutions um, certainly, uh, um, uh, the court and the CPT engage in regular consultations. We have uh, already established uh, an excellent practice when uh, a group of uh, uh, judges from the court um, is joined by, uh, by the CPT or, the, or, they, or they join a meeting of the CPT. And we have very long, very, very important, uh, very constructive discussions on various matters of uh, uh, our mutual interest and I'm happy to see that uh, with every year there is more and more enthusiasm on the part of the court and also on the part of the CPT about this relationship. Um, in principle, 
I think that uh, it's a perfect match, you know, the court and the CPT, because the court is important because it is a judicial body. It is very much respected in Europe. It is uh, the the backbone of the of the European system of, of protection of human rights. But uh, it can only be reactive. So the court needs to be activated by uh, people who send applications. And the CPT is a body which is proactive, which has unlimited access, which can show up in any place of deprivation of liberty uh, in any part of Europe. And it is proactively looking for potential problems. And it comes there to assess the situation and help the authorities to avoid those problems. This is very helpful because human rights would be better protected. This is very helpful also institutionally because the court, if the governments actually were to implement CPT recommendations, the court would have less uh, work because the, we, we all know that the court is overwhelmed with a constant flood of applications from prisoners about bad conditions. So in that respect, the best strategy for the government would be to cooperate meaningfully with the CPT and also to take advantage of uh, cooperation programs from the Council of Europe. And then the court will be less busy. The important thing about CPT standards is that they always try to be realistic. So uh, the recommendations we make to the authorities, they are always uh, based on the real situation in the country. So the CPT uh, never wants to become a dogmatic body that would just reiterate something without a real prospect of this getting implemented at some point. So uh, the CPT can say that there is a sort of general goal to do something, but then it tries to uh, formulate a realistic way of, of implementing uh, uh, the recommendations of bringing the existing practice uh, in conformity with the European Convention on Human Rights as understood by the court. Well, and the CPT of course, but the CPT is guided by the court's, um, by the court's understanding. And uh, so on the one hand, it's all very practical. On the other hand, the CPT uh, does not have and actually should not, should never, uh, uh, attempt to establish violations of the Convention. Uh, the CPT's role is to establish the uh, uh, factors that might lead to the violation of the Convention. Therefore, um, the CPT uh, ventures into certain areas which would not strictly be within uh, the scope of Article 3 if we were just to look for the violation of Article 3. But the CPT also thinks that certain matters that the court would uh, consider under Article 5, under Article 8 of the Convention, that they might very well end up in a violation of Article 3 if uh, there is no appropriate action from the government. So in that respect, the CPT's uh, standards ca can be more sort of far-reaching. And uh, the CPT might, for example, uh, say that uh, it believes that the detention of unaccompanied minors, let's say, in, in the context of immigration detention, is uh, is unacceptable because we, uh, not because we are, you know, making a judgment on Article Five of the Convention, because we think that it would be virtually impossible to create conditions for those uh, uh, minors that would be compliant with Article Three. So that 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 would be the logic. The court. Um, is I think is 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 very attentive to the CPT's uh, standards. Sometimes uh, I think the court uh, is uh, even looking for certain CPT standards which are not yet there. <laughs> Um, so I, th there have been examples in the past when the court would uh, uh, read some working documents published, officially declassified working documents of the CPT, and sometimes even take it a little bit, even by mistake, for for the existing standard of the CPT. It happened once with. Uh, with a working document of the CPT on the context of prisoners with the outside world. But uh, um, uh, still, I don't think that the court can be uh, accused of uh, ignoring CPT standards. Um, so in principle, I think there is, uh, there is no uh, issue with uh, us being uh, you know, too progressive for the court. Every time the European Court of Human Rights quotes CPT standards, they, uh, they become strengthened. They are better accessible for the government. 
Sometimes, um, paradoxically, the way certain European governments operate is that there is no real dialogue even within a certain government between those people who are responsible for the execution of the, the court's judgment and those people who are responsible for cooperating with the monitoring bodies like the CPT. So in that respect, I think we make them realize that in fact there is a system, there is a mechanism that uh, the, the, the CPT uh, also belongs to, to the, to the, to the uh, machinery of the Council of Europe, which is aimed to uh, implement the European Convention on Human Rights. So in that respect, um, the CPT uh, gets more authority from the court uh, when its recommendations are endorsed by the court officially. So this is, for us, this is, this is of course very, very good and very important. Um, another part of this is that um, the governments uh, come to understand, well sometimes it takes time, but they come to understand that um, uh, implementing CPT's recommendations is the best again, strategy to avoid uh, problems uh, with the court, to, to avoid uh, lots of violations being found uh, by the court in respect of persons deprived of their liberty. So there, again, I think there is, there is uh, obvious, uh, obvious synergy. And uh, uh, when the court is uh, uh, more proactive, when the court uh, uh, issues pilot judgments on uh, matters which fall under the CPT's mandate, then uh, there are additional opportunities of the CPT helping the government actually to implement the, pub, the, 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 the pilot judgment. Because uh, the pilot judgment is all about sort of general, uh, general uh, measures and the CPT can be very handy and can, can actually tell the government what exactly should be done to uh, meet the expectations of the court. And in that respect, there is this uh, triangle, the court, the CPT, and the Committee of Ministers through its function of supervising the execution of uh, decisions of the European Court of Human Rights. And that also strengthens our, our common cause. So the it's not just that the work of the CPT influences the work of the court. Of course, the court's work <laughs> influences the CPT very much, uh, in various ways. Um, one way is that, of course, if you read CPT reports, you will see a lot of references uh, to the relevant judgments of the European Court of Human Rights. This is very helpful to have such judgments. This, again, strengthens the argument of the CPT. And this, again, helps us uh, uh, also coordinate uh, the work of the government, even inside the government. So sometimes we have to help uh, certain states to, to better organize themselves, unfortunately. Um, now, when uh, the court issues a pilot judgment, or even a quasi-pilot uh, judgment, where there are some prominent uh, general measures, the CPT is of course very attentive to the progress of how these measures are being implemented. The CPT in any case has the benefit of having a very strong secretariat which uh, is uh, following on the ongoing basis the developments of in every single uh, member state of the Council of Europe. But also uh, on uh, these particular activities we can join forces with uh, the Department for the Execution of Judgments of the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, and uh, our own visiting program can actually depend on this because um, for us it might be important actually to uh, carry out an ad hoc visit to a country and see what exactly is the progress, whether they're going in the right direction or not. And if we feel that, that, that there is an issue, then of course we would not <laughs> hesitate to take the government, to tell the government that they, they need to uh, adjust a little bit their, uh, their policies. So uh, this is all very uh, helpful for us. And I can give you an example of a country uh, where I have personally been very active for many years. It is uh, Bulgaria, where the court, uh, where the CPT identified uh, structural, long-standing issues with the treatment of persons uh, who were deprived of their liberties in penitentiary institutions, in prisons. Uh, due to the very, very uh, uh, poor state of the prison estate, of, 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 of very poor material conditions and also lack of proper regime and also uh, corruption in the prison system which uh, also uh, had, a, had, a, had some influence even on the actual ill treatment, physical violence against prisoners uh, inside, uh, inside the system. Uh, and uh, the CPT at some point was feeling that its dialogue with the Bulgarian authorities 
was reaching a dead end. Uh, we, we couldn't really find any way to, to, to progress. Um, and uh, the CPT opened the procedure uh, under uh, Article 10, Paragraph 2 of its uh, convention, which uh, may lead to a public statement on the country. Uh, and uh, uh, when the CPT finally decided to make this public statement in 2015, also uh, we saw that the court uh, issued a pilot judgment in uh, the case of Neshkov and Nazas versus Bulgaria. And essentially, the court was very well informed by CPT reports, but also uh, by the flood of applications that, ca that, that were arriving from Bulgaria in Strasbourg. So, um, we, uh, in the execution of that judgment, uh, the CPT worked very closely with the Department for the Execution of, of, of ECHR judgments, and we had uh, very helpful roundtables with the authorities where we didn't just discuss the, the, the problems, we discussed the practical ways and the, 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 the very concrete action plan, how to address those problems. And uh, two years later, already in 2017, the CPT uh, came to Bulgarian prisons to see what the progress had been. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, we could say that the, the, the authorities appeared to be on the, on the, on the, right, on the right track back then. So, this is, this is an example, I think, uh, where we, which we should follow in other, in other countries whenever uh, there are issues between the uh, CPT, uh, issues that are identified by the CPT and the court. Uh, and, and these would be essentially the same, um, the same issues. And I think there is uh, a great potential in, in this work uh, for quite a number of European countries. Kudwa versus uh, Poland judgment was very, uh, I think, uh, was very important uh, as a matter of principle because it uh, showed the, the turn of the of the court uh, to the uh, actual prison conditions uh, and to the potential for the violation of Article Three by uh, the failure of a state to uh, exercise its duty of care for the persons who are placed uh, in uh, in penitentiary institutions. And uh, this also opened the huge, uh, I think, uh, part of work for, this, for the court, where the court started uh, addressing the issues in uh, various countries on a case-by-case -case basis, but also systematically through pilot judgments. For the CPT, it uh, meant that the CPT uh, re has uh, received a very strong ally um, in, in the court, which was exactly the intention of uh, uh, the drafters of the, of the CPT convention. Uh, now, uh, can the European system actually identify the problems uh, in uh, uh, European prisons and can it uh, uh, react adequately to those problems? I think uh, um, if uh, uh, we continue to work like we have worked for the last uh, 20 years and also using uh, the a positive experience and uh, developing the positive experience that we have uh, uh, made together, I think that uh, um, it is possible to identify the problems because uh, the ongoing dialogue between the CPT and every single European state actually makes it quite easy for the CPT to be aware of the existing uh, problems and the system of visits with periodic and also ad hoc visits for the CPT is very helpful in that respect. Um, the automatic publication of CPT reports, or at least a speedy publication of CPT reports following its uh, adoption, plays a very important role because it makes both uh, nationally and internationally all the, all the stakeholders, all the relevant actors aware of the issues. And the court can then uh, make use of, of, of the CPT's findings. So that, that, is, uh, that is a very, very important uh, element to this. Uh, the court itself understands that it has this mission of uh, addressing uh, prison conditions in Europe because uh, if uh, prison conditions are neglected, this erodes the society um, in general and uh, this uh, uh, can very, 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 very seriously uh, impact uh, in a negative way the situation with human rights in general in any, in any country. So the court knows that this is a topic which uh, will uh, remain very high on agenda 
not just statistically because of, of, of the um, huge numbers of applications go, uh, arriving uh, uh, in Strasbourg ev you know, every month, but uh, also because this is important to uphold the system uh, in general. So I think the European system is, is, is well equipped. Now the main um, uh, advantage uh, of the European system uh, the fact that it is based on the cooperation between the uh, international bodies, the European bodies, uh, Council of Europe bodies and the states is also the main weakness of the system. Because you have to have the cooperation. You know, sometimes persons who are less uh, sort of aware of, of, of how it works in, in, in reality might think that, okay, well, the CPT is, uh, of course, is dependent on, on the cooperation with the state because it issues recommendations. Recommendations are not meant to be legally binding, so the CPT just needs goodwill and so on. But the European Court of Human Rights just makes judgments, and the judgment is, of course, legally binding. So for the court, it's, it's easy. But it's not easy for the court at all, at all. And uh, the court is very much dependent on the cooperation of the state concerned. I would say to the same degree as the CPT. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, problems with the execution of the court's judgments, in particular in the field of uh, prison conditions, uh, demonstrate that states actually uh, are not very much afraid and the Council of Europe does not have anything actually to uh, make them fearful of. It's, it's, it's a different uh, problem. The states should actually own the standards of the Council of Europe. They should own the CPT standards. They should own the court jurisprudence. They should understand that this is not something external imposed on them, but this is what they need to have to uh, make their societies better, to discharge also the duties that every European state would have vis-a-vis -vis its uh, uh, own citizens and uh, all persons under its jurisdiction, uh, simply uh, in accordance with the constitution of the, of, of the state concerned. So in this respect, uh, it is uh, very much problematic when uh, states demonstrate reluctance to engage with the European bodies. And uh, this is the main danger I see for the future, because uh, in, a, in a number of cases, I must tell you, you know, I, I try to be very inventive, and my colleagues in the CPT, we all try to be very inventive in, 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 in advancing our dialogue with the states concerned. Uh, but uh, sometimes when you see literally zero desire or very, 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 very weak uh, uh, desire to cooperate with the Council of Europe in principle, with the CPT, or to pay significant attention to the court's judgments, then uh, unfortunately there is not much one can do because um, uh, you know, human rights uh, cannot be imposed from outside of the country. The state uh, and the society should actually uh, want human rights to be the basis uh, for, for their life. And uh, this very much depends, of course, on, on the politicians and on the way uh, that uh, the societies at large understand the problem. So it, 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 it depends very much on the appropriate education. It uh, depends very much on, on, on the sensitivity of, 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 uh, of the European societies in various countries to this. So uh, this would be, in my opinion, the main challenge and the main problem. One of the um, features of the court uh, system is that uh, the court needs to be addressed by, by an applicant to uh, start and uh, uh, pronounce itself on, a, on an issue, for example, of uh, violence inside a prison, being, be it uh, staff on, on prisoner violence or inter-prisoner violence. And uh, um, for the CPT, th this problem doesn't exist because the CPT has direct access to the prisons, to the prisoners. It knows how to interview people confidentially, how to build trust with them, how to assess uh, uh, the consistency of their allegations. And in that respect, uh, uh, the CPT's uh, uh, findings uh, reflected in its reports can be very troubling. And at the same time, there might, might be no confirmation of this in the court's jurisprudence simply because no one has actually asked the court about this, no one has complained to the court about this. There is not much one can do about this. I think this is predominantly the role of uh, lawyers at the domestic level. When the legal profession is strong, when there's independent bar, when there are lawyers who can have access to the prisoners and the lawyers who are not afraid to challenge their country, then uh, the court will inevitably 
receive these allegations and receive these applications uh, if something bad is really happening. Uh, so this is uh, uh, something that can't be solved overnight. I think it's, it's, it's more for uh, also for the Council of Europe in the other parts of the organization uh, to try and enhance the independence and professionalism of the legal profession and uh, of, the, of the lawyers and uh, of the criminal defense lawyers in particular and uh, also to support the NGOs which uh, uh, do this uh, job very often in most cases uh, just for free. The options existing for the CPT to remedy the situation, to uh, strengthen the domestically the legal profession are fairly limited. The CPT has done it, uh, I think, rather clearly uh, regarding the uh, police detention. Uh, the uh, access uh, to a lawyer is the key standard that was developed uh, by the CPT from the outset, uh, from the very beginning of, 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 its, uh, of its activities. And the CPT has also often uh, made points about the uh, uh, the necessity to have a functioning legal aid system, about the uh, necessity for lawyers, especially those who come ex officio to police stations to exercise their duties conscientiously. But uh, it's much more difficult for the, uh, for the prisons. The CPT has uh, made uh, certain recommendations concerning um, access of lawyers to convicted prisoners. Uh, in particular as regards Turkey, but uh, uh, I, I'm afraid uh, the general standard is not there yet because it is sometimes not very obvious how to make this, this link uh, between the actual findings and these, uh, these uh, standards. The CPT at the same time has emphasized uh, um, many times, including in a, in a recent general report, on the necessity to have a functioning and a, trans and a trustworthy system of uh, complaints within prisons and within other uh, places of deprivation of liberty. So this is covered by, by the complaints recommendations of the CPT, which I admit are of a very generic uh, uh, nature. It's easier, I think, for the ECHR to uh, uh, ac approach this, at least when it comes to the NGOs, because the ECHR can, and, and as far as I know, the ECHR has actually encouraged uh, the, inter the third party interventions in important cases from uh, non-governmental organizations. This is, I think, very positive practice that should be continued by the court. Mm -hmm.